Diablo 2 is a hack and slash dark fantasy role playing game released June 28th in the year 2000 at the turn of the millennium. Diablo 2 is a game that has often been cited as one of the greatest games of all time, and to me, that seems an apt comparison. This was a game created at a time when Blizzard Entertainment was at its peak of creativity, the Warcraft series was going strong, and counter to the bright and colorful fantasy world of Azeroth, there was the darker and gloomier fantasy world of Sanctuary, a name that betrays the very nature of the setting. Sanctuary is a world of demons, monsters, dangers, and ultimately the struggle against the most primal forces of destruction, fear, and terror. Rewind the clock from the current day back to sometime between 2005 and 2007. I apologize for not remembering exactly when. Those days in my younger years were an interesting time. As I always mention, despite growing up quite poor, many of my friends and people I knew were gamers like me. Even though I never had games, a lot of people I knew did, and at this time, my father played a lot of horseshoes. I know that's a weird addition to the video, but stick with me, it'll pay off in a second. One of his friends had horseshoe pits at his house, and he always dragged me over there. While these friends of his were fine people, as a young boy, I wasn't particularly interested in hanging out with a bunch of Midwest dads throwing around horseshoes. That was not young Josh's idea of a good time. At the time, and in typical Midwest fashion, this friend of my father's had a son, James, who lived in the basement. James was a bit older than me, but I'm not sure how much older. The great thing about James, though, is that James knew the struggle I was going through of wanting to be a gamer, but coming from a family not financially able to support a hobby or recreation that expensive. Much to my delight, he was a fellow gamer and had very similar tastes in games. I certainly wouldn't call James chatty, but he definitely wasn't rude. I always felt he went out of his way to make sure I was entertained when I was there. He let me play his PS2 while he went out and drank and played horseshoes with the adults, and I happily enjoyed my time gaming and playing games I never had a chance to play before. One fateful day, he would ask me if I was interested in trying a different game he had loaded onto his computer. I agreed, and he booted up Diablo 2 and gave me a very brief rundown of the controls. Now, I'm not a skilled gamer. I always just kind of brute force my way through games until I learn the little nuances and can try different kinds of builds. Fortunately, Diablo 2 was a game that was easy for me to figure out as a kid, at least easy to figure out mechanically. Everything else was a pain for me. The furthest I made it as a kid was to Act 2, and I barely made it there. Suffice to say, this game ensnared my mind and ensorcelled me to my very core, a feeling that most people in the heyday of Diablo 2 can probably attest to. Every subsequent weekend, I was hounding my old man nonstop, wondering if he was going to play horseshoes at his friend's house, because I was just so desperate to play more Diablo 2. I wasn't doing much or really engaging with the story, I was just going around fighting monsters in the Act 1 world space. I can't really remember any point in time, at least back then, that I was even engaging with this story, truthfully. I must have at some point, because as I stated earlier, I did make it to Act 2. Having played the game fairly recently, even prior to me gathering footage for this video, quests like The Den of Evil and Sisters to the Slaughter stand out to me now. But one I remember from this specific time period is Den of Evil, which I will elaborate on later. Instead of alluding to quests, how about I move along and we dive into some of the character classes. Character classes are a major feature of the Diablo series, and people often discuss them in their favorites. Class speculation, at least among me and my friends, was a major conversation topic when news was initially releasing about Diablo 4. I can't even imagine the excitement fans must have felt in 1999 or 2000 getting to speculate. Coming off the first Diablo game with only three classes, and a fourth with Hellfire, the original classes being Warrior, Wizard, and Rogue. 
Very classic and very easy D&D style rudimentary characters. They did exactly what you would expect. Your warrior was a heavy hitter, heavy armor that could tank hits and dish out major damage. Your wizard, a spell slinger capable of unleashing loads of arcane damage, and someone who rates very highly on Blizzard's modern diversity tools. And lastly, the rogue. Your long range archer, lightly armored, and someone who preferred dealing death from afar. I know it seems like a bit of a tangent, and it was, but that's just because classes on offering in Diablo 2 were so unlike anything the series had seen before. When Blizzard first started showing off things like the Necromancer or Barbarian, I imagine fans at the time were losing their minds, and rightfully so. The classes on offer for Diablo 2 were as follows. Your base game classes were Amazon, Barbarian, Necromancer, Paladin, and Sorceress with two additional classes being added via the Lords of Destruction expansion, those being Druid and Assassin. Here is a brief, and I mean very brief, breakdown of the classes and roughly what they're about. I'm not a pro Diablo player who has a master level min-max build to give you for each class. I don't enjoy playing games that way, and I'm not a competitive ladder or season player. I generally only engage with the seasons if there's something I think looks cool enough to grind for. And even then, that was like one time just to get the gift of Anarius Necromancer armor in Diablo 3. Anyway, the classes. Amazon. The Amazon is all about spears, javelins, bows, and crossbows. She is at her best when dealing damage at range, but up close with a spear, she is no slouch. In my opinion, she is a very versatile and surprising character. She is fast, and when you can get at a distance, you'll find she is a wonderful character or ally to have in your party. Barbarian the Barbarian is all about dealing damage and soaking it up in return. The Barbarian is at his best when utilizing his war cries in conjunction with the biggest weapons you can find, namely two-handed melee weapons. If you enjoy using one massive swing to annihilate a horde of demons in the blink of an eye, then the Barbarian is the kind of person your party needs. Necromancer the Necromancer is my favorite class in Diablo 2. Necromancers focus on summoning and curses that debuff enemies. They can debuff enemies and then swarm them with skeletons, a golem, and hit them with some poisons and bone spells. If you enjoy the idea of having a small undead horde accompanying you and your party on your journeys, then the Necromancer will be a fantastic addition to your party of heroes. Paladin the Paladin is another melee tank, but the Paladin throws out auras, offensive and defensive prayers that bolster the party, making them stronger and making them more able to take damage. The Paladin is a great support warrior if your party needs those kind of auras keeping them on their feet a bit longer in tough fights. If that sounds like your kind of thing, then consider bringing a skilled Paladin. You won't regret it. Sorceress. The Sorceress is pure, raw, and powerful elemental magic. Cold spells, lightning spells, and fire spells. She can become a veritable powerhouse of damage dealing in the right hands, and she is entirely unapologetic about it. Where the Necromancer is more of a support-focused hero, the Sorceress is a damage dealer in its purest form. Hitting from a distance like the Amazons, but instead of bolts and bows, she uses the elements as her weapon. I consider the Sorceress an auto-include for any party. If you need the forces of magic bent to your party's will to deal out heaps of damage, the Sorceress is exactly what your party needs. With the introduction of the Lords of Destruction expansion pack, two more powerful classes were added to the Diablo 2 roster, and those are the Assassin and the Druid. Assassin. The Assassin is a martial artist, but also a stealthy trap setter. She is a fast and roguish figure who can deal that damage up close and personal, but can also slow or stall an enemy with a trap before coming in to Muay Thai them into the next dimension. If you want someone who can use more unique styles of weapons in-game, but also someone who can bring an interesting and fun-to-witness playstyle to your party, then an assassin would be a worthwhile addition. Druid. 
The Druid is a shapeshifter and magical damage dealer, and if I remember correctly, also has summons. The Druid can turn into a werewolf and werebear, and call upon woodland animals like wolves and bears to fight for them, and also cast some powerful spells to really send the demons back to the burning hells. If you're looking for a character with all sorts of tricks up their sleeve, then look no further than the Druid. A real boon for any group of wandering heroes. There is a place of great evil in the wilderness. Kasha's rogue scouts have informed me that a cave nearby is filled with shadowy creatures and horrors from beyond the grave. I will endeavor, as always, to keep this as spoiler-free as possible, though I can't promise anything. So here is your 24-year-plus spoiler alert. The story of Diablo 2 follows your party on a trail of a mysterious dark wanderer. Wherever this enigmatic figure goes, hell quite literally follows. Arriving at the rogue encampment, you and your friends are immediately thrown into the game's first quest, the Den of Evil, where you must go to a nearby cave and clear it of demons, monsters, and undead. This den is also home to the first boss of the game and someone I think most Diablo 2 players have a fond memory of overcoming, the zombie known as Corpse Fire. I can't say for certain, but I'm willing to bet that much like me, Corpse Fire was the majority of Diablo players' first actual boss fight in the Diablo universe. And I know in the grand scheme of things, Corpse Fire isn't a very strong or even mildly important entity. But I have fond memories of this encounter, and I always love when I start a new playthrough. There are four different acts that take you to vastly different hub locations in surrounding countrysides. Act 1's hub is the Rogue Encampment, a location in the Kingdom of Conduras. This area is a plain and grassland, a very rainy and wet environment, filled to the brim with demons, beastmen, and corrupted rogues. You and your party must take on quests and fight your way through areas like Black Marsh, the Cold Plains, Stony Fields, and if you survive, you will make it to the Monastery of the Rogues and confront the demon Andariel, the Maiden of Anguish, one of the Burning Hell's lesser evils. Act 2's hub is the city of Lutgolain. Despite its desert climate, I do not believe Lutgolain is actually part of Sanctuary's eastern empire, Kejistan. Nor do I believe it's part of the western kingdoms like Westmarch or Conduras. It seems to be its own independent polity, acting as a gateway between the western kingdoms and Kejistan, and vice versa. The area around Lutgolain is a dry and arid desert scape. Monsters, demons, and all kinds of otherworldly and eastern-inspired creatures make their homes here. You will travel in dangerous sewers, dry hills, the far oasis, demon-infested cellars, a lost city, and even an arcane sanctuary. Once you survive these trials and tribulations, your party will take on Duriel, the Lord of Pain, another of the lesser evils, and the twin brother to Andariel. Act 3's hub zone is the Kurast Docks. Kurast was once a great city of Kejistan. Now it lies in ruins. Demons stalk the land as they do in all places visited by the Dark Wanderer. The area around the docks is an overgrown and feral jungle. You will need to be careful navigating the labyrinthine paths of the Spider Forest, Great Marsh, and the Flare Jungle. Eventually you will be making your way to the ruins of Travancal former home to the High Council of Zacharum. They have been corrupted by Mephisto and have fallen. Once in the ruins, you'll have to fight your way past them and their zealots to the Infernal Gate, where you will face one of the prime evils themselves, Mephisto, the Lord of Hatred. Act 4's hub zone is the Pandemonium Fortress, a location very familiar to Diablo 3 players as a major plot location in the Reaper of Souls expansion pack. Around here is where the real big boys and hard hitters are. To give you an idea of the magnitude of danger you'll be in, if you thought places like Black Marsh, Fields of Misery, Spider Forest, Flare Jungle, and the Dry Hills sounded scary, wait until you're facing down Doom Knights and Venom Lords in the Outer Steps, Plains of Despair, the City of the Damned, and the River of Flame, and the final dungeon itself, Diablo's Chaos Sanctuary. 
The Outer Steps will force you to fight against Doomcasters, Venom Lords, Flesh Beasts, and Cliff Lurkers. The Plains of Despair will offer a similar challenge, but will also include Burning Souls, Pit Lords, then take the City of the Damned and its Abyss Knights, Stygian Dogs, Maw Fiends, Dark Familiars, and the Damned themselves. The River of Flame was personally one of my least favorite areas. Not because it was bad by any means, but because for me, it was one of the most grueling challenges I've ever faced in a game. I'm sure some Diablo 2 players may laugh at this, but I've always said I'm not very good at games. So for someone who's quite likely, in all definitions, a casual, this area was always a brutal fight for me. Abandon hope, all ye who enter there. But none of that compares to what awaits you at the end. The Chaos Sanctuary, full of Doom Knights, Oblivion Knights, Storm Casters, and more Venom Lords. Good luck against the Infector of Souls, Lord Say, and the Grand Vizier of Chaos. Those three, plus Diablo himself, are going to put you and your party through their paces. One of the best and oft still discussed aspects of the story was the beautiful cutscenes and narrations of the character Marius, the one who tells the tale of the Dark Wanderer as Marius was his companion. Voiced by the incredibly talented Frank Gorshin, he brings a level of skill and emotion to the narration of the story and Marius's recounting of his travels with the Dark Wanderer that upon revisiting the game almost two decades later, I did not remember from when I was a kid. It was a pleasant surprise as his work really resonates and you can feel the weight on Marius' heart and soul as he's spilling the story to the cloaked figure in his chamber. Now you know what I seek, Marius. This is my brother. Sleep now. We set out with the dawn. Revisiting this story in the world of Sanctuary for me is always a delight. The nostalgia is massive with this game, and it hits in a different way compared to games like Oblivion or Morrowind, because this was a game I had very brief contact with as a kid, but the brief time I had with it was substantial and impactful. So much so that I'm still talking about it almost 20 years later. In my teen years, when I finally had my own, at the time, modern gaming console, and I could catch up on the years of games I missed, or could only play at friends' houses, Diablo 2, being a PC game, was a game that was often thought about, but was never able to be accessed, because I wasn't a PC player. When I was done enjoying Oblivion, replaying Fable, playing Fable 2, exploring the capital wastelands of Fallout 3, and revisiting Vardenfell via Morrowind, Diablo 2 was a game that always stuck to me. But the time in my childhood playing this game wasn't limited exclusively to the introductory period I had with James. Living behind my house in a quick hop across the fence were three brothers, David, Michael, and Chris. David was older than me, Michael was my age and a close friend growing up, and Chris was the youngster among us all. Growing up, we all shared a love of gaming, similar toys, and in particular, we had a love of high fantasy and military sci-fi. When I would hang out with those brothers, the main things we obsessed over in that group were G.I. Joe and anything G.I. Joe related, Command and Conquer, Red Alert 2, and Fable. Upon learning of Diablo 2, I mentioned it to them, only for David to light up instantly because David was also a Diablo fan, in particular Diablo 2. Where James introduced me to the game and let me figure things out, David was the second piece of the puzzle. David taught me, and by extension his younger brothers as well, about the characters, the world, and showed us how to play the game in an efficient manner. Or at least in a manner that wasn't aimless wandering like I was used to. Our love of Diablo was such a big thing that we used to run around the yard with sticks, and we would like tape, like cardboard, to ourselves as armor, and we had many adventures in the yards pretending to fight monsters we saw in the game. These moments I still remember to this day. David usually acted as our party leader and was essentially our game master. He would tell us of what we were seeing and would lead us in heroic charges, swinging our sticks wildly in hopes of felling the mighty beasts before us. 
Thinking about those moments now as I write this are things I haven't thought about in a long time, and they are bringing so many smiles to my face just recounting them here on this Google Doc. Fast forward many years later to the final piece of this puzzle. This is a friend you've heard mentioned in my Dragon Age Origins video, Angel. A friend who is a brother to me. Because in all those years I was playing this game solo, or we were taking turns sharing a character, Angel was the first person I ever partied with in this game. And that was only a year or two ago we did that. I introduced him to the Diablo series by way of Diablo 3 on Xbox, where me, him, and my brother Brian played the game religiously for quite a long time. Years after our excursions fighting Diablo and Malthale, I got into PC gaming and decided to get Diablo 2. Angel was already a fan of 3 and had heard me rave about Diablo 2 for many years, so he jumped in immediately, and it became a favorite of his. Long after he and I stopped playing, he went and beat the game like two or three more times with different characters. Those moments of him sending me updates on what he was doing and all the fun he was having made me proud as a gamer and friend to have introduced him to something so pivotal to his gaming experience, and a game he has said that he treasures greatly. <laughs> started this Why I Love series as an excuse to look back on games that shaped my love of gaming, storytelling, and adventure. Games that forged friendships and unbreakable brotherhoods that have stood the test of time. Games that entire generations of young, or at least young at the time, gamers, flocked to for a sense of fun and camaraderie. And games that brought something simpler than all of that. Games that brought a sense of joy. Diablo 2 for me was more than a game, it was an inspiration for a whole host of childhood adventures, a game that inspired myself and a set of brothers across the fence to expand our minds and use our creativity to tell stories in the backyards. Stories where we were abolishing evils and protecting a world our parents couldn't understand from evils only us kids could see. Stories where a stick was a mighty blade, and a branch was a focus for powerful spells. Stories where, in the end, we were the heroes, and when the lights went out at the end of the day, stories we reminisced about when we were supposed to be sleeping, and stories we dreamt about when we finally did sleep. And that is why I, and so many others, love Diablo 2. And here we are, my favorite part at the end of a video. This one's going to be slightly longer. But I have to make a quick video correction. When I was writing this script originally, I had all this nostalgia and there was all these kind of feelings hitting me, thinking about just a, a, a fun little time in my life. And I found James on Facebook because I was Facebook friends with his one of his older brothers. And I reached out to him. I sent him this super long message. I was like, James, thank you so much for uh, introducing me to Diablo. And I was asking his permission to tell this story. And he was like, yeah, no problem. But I don't play Diablo. And I was like, oh, what? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, that was my brother Timmy. And I hate to say it and sound rude or ungrateful, but I just, I didn't remember Timmy. So he, he sent me his Facebook and I was looking at Timmy's Facebook. I sent him a friend request. I haven't had time to talk to him before uh, finishing up this video. And I was so late in the video creation process when I finally got a hold of him that I couldn't, I couldn't change it. I tried, but it was causing me so many audio issues. It was, I don't know what happened when I originally tried it. There was like this cascading failure, but Timmy, thank you for introducing me to this game. But when I looked at Timmy's Facebook, I was like, this guy looks exactly like his father. So maybe just because it was so long ago, my head just melded them into one person. I, I, I don't know. So that is a, an error on my part. Uh, so you'll have to forgive me for that. But, Timmy, I hope you see this video, and I hope you liked it. Just replace uh, your brother's name with your name. And, uh, you know, that was that was you. You did that for me, and I'm so grateful. Also, um, uh, I had a lot going on recently. I took a break from creating content, not in the sense that... Uh, not in the sense that uh, it was becoming too stressful or anything. I was just very busy working, so I just didn't have time to devote to anything, and I was, I had gathered footage for this video, I had a very major project, which I'll talk about in a second, that I was doing for work, and then Space Marine 2 came out, 
And I had to play Space Marine 2, like, four times into all the PvE. Uh, I'm a big Warhammer fan over here, so that that, that kind of absorbed a good portion of my life. But there's one thing, um, well, not one thing, one person that I try to always thank that sometimes gets a little overlooked around here, and that's a lot of my friends and people that support me on this. One thing, not just content creation, I got, as you guys know, I'm a Warhammer fan, I talk about it a lot, um, if you've watched some of my other videos, or if you're in our Discord, link in the description below, join in there. I finished up purchasing books for the second edition of Kill Team. I ended up getting Nightmare, Salvation, and Termination. There we go. These were the last, uh, kind of dossiers I needed for kill teams and stats and all that. I like to have physical copies of stuff. I'm weird like that. So, Hurricane Milton came where I live recently, and I had ordered these books weeks ahead of time, and they were canceled because of Hurricane Helene. They got delivered whilst I was out of town because I left uh, from the storm because my home was in an area that was said it was going to be affected. It was not affected. I came home. Things were fine. No damage. So we're all good there. That said, two of these books ended up getting delivered when I was gone. I was worried about them getting washed away. I called my friend JJ, who was one of my normal Kill Team partners, and he drove very far from his house to my house to pick these up, and he safeguarded uh, those packages for me for days. So JJ, thank you. I know you're going to be watching this video at some point. Um, and another person I really want to thank, Lena. Lena designs the thumbnails on this channel, and she does a fine job. If you saw the thumbnail and you liked it, let her know. Uh, drop it down in the comments. But Lena, what you don't know, is Lena is a big fan of Deadpool. She loves the movies. And I happen to know somebody that was in those movies, a gentleman by the name of Randall Reeder. He played Buck, the mercenary, in all of the films. Uh, and here's a picture of him right there. Cool. Now, Lena has always been a great and supportive friend to me, so I had Randall make a quick video because when I was working on a film trailer with him, I wasn't able to chit-chat and talk to her as often as we usually do. But before I get to that, I just want to say, if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, consider subscribing. You don't have to do it, just consider it. But, if none of that is your jam, I am just so glad that you took time out of your day to be here with me, and I will see you in the next one. Uh, hey, Lena, sorry I haven't chit-chatted with you. Like, you know, I've been busy. But I have somebody that wanted to say hi to you. He's been grabbing my crotch. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know what your thing is, man. Just because I look like Fat Cat. Wait, well, I kind of played Fat Cat off. But anyway. Hey, Lena. What's <laughs> up? It's yeah. Lena, right? Yeah. Lena? Yep. Lena's a great name. Yep. We wanted yeah. to say hi to you. And I wanted to apologize for not being an active friend lately. Yeah. Why do you put up with him? But I'm glad you do, Lena. Because I love this guy. Oh, thanks, man.